All right, we are live. I've got Luis Sanchez. Good afternoon, right up on the comments up top. So welcome everybody, and welcome Mark Littler. Evening or afternoon, Bart. Are you right? There you go. That's right. For me, it's about two p.m. And what is it? Is it eight your time? Seven p.m. in the UK at the moment. Seven p.m. All right, and Mark, of course, is the owner of Cheaper by the Dram. We're going to be talking about this in a little bit. But real quick, I figured we would open up since it is kind of weird times right now. So mm. first of all, where is Scott? Scott's usually sitting here. Well, Scott, about four months ago, planned a cruise. Not turns out a good time to do a cruise, but he wasn't sure if it was going to go or not. Uh, so he'd said, hey, go, go on with the show. He drove down to Texas and he got all the way down there and he found out, no, they will not do the cruise and he was like, okay. He texted me. I said, well, yeah, I wondered if he was going to come back. And he said, you know, we're down here with family that they were going to cruise with. So they're staying and bunkering down in Texas. Um, I know he already had a liquor store or two down there. So I'm sure they're having fun in Texas. <laughs> um, but that is where we're at. Things have been getting crazier and crazier. What's it like over in the UK or in your parts there, Mark? Oh, it's, it's all just started to get a little bit weird, to be honest. I think it's all come a bit close to home now. So until Thursday, Friday, everyone was quite chill. And now it's sort of like this weekend, It's this, the shops are bare. Everyone's, you know, taking a wide berth of everyone. And it's just, it makes you realize that we're just, an organism on a planet in the middle of the solar system and a virus that we can't even see can just, you know, it shows how vulnerable we are, doesn't it? And there's, you know, so there's more no. life than worrying about money and stuff, isn't there? You've just got to think of your health and your whiskey. <laughs> you right. know. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you're a hundred percent. It got, you know, there was some, well, there was concern as it hit the States and then, um, you know, it was, it, I, I, Totally agree with a lot of the sentiment that, hey, if you're not in a risk area or, you know, my like my my folks are definitely in the risk area. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I get the idea. I've had the flu. It's terrible. And yeah. I'm my full time job. Uh, I'm in law enforcement. So we started doing some normal prep and what we would do if our folks got sick because we didn't want them coming in. But then the cases started hitting in Kansas, where I'm at. Yeah. And then we had one in Wichita at a hospital. And as soon as the – now, he was actually had been on a cruise, an older gentleman, and came back. And as soon as that hit, it was every – I mean, first, all our sports were getting canceled. Yes. And then it was events. Yes. Yeah. Everything. Churches, groups over 250 are outlawed, but we're not enforcing, like, criminal stuff if they meet so churches quit meeting have you guys done that over there as well not really there's there's not really been any sort of uh, banning of of social events or anything yet i mean Cheltenham, a massive horse racing festival over here like sixty thousand people met on friday you know they've, they've cancelled a lot of the football but it, it who knows you know it, you, you can live i think the problem is is if you watch too much of the media you end up in this just sort of like frenzy of everything's going to go wrong but you're just going to be calm and just sort of look after your family check everyone's okay and just be sensible you know it's you know i'm a bit of a pragmatist like that so me too me too what stunned me at least on this side was that people started hoarding toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> has that happened on your guys is it, i mean you yeah. can't yeah you can't find it and someone's done it. There's, there's a meme on the internet earlier on Facebook. It was someone had calculated how many rolls are in a on the average toilet roll and how many, uh, should we say, uses you get out of a roll of toilet paper. Come on, it's like nine should last you a decent amount of time. Unless not, go and seek medical attention because there's something wrong with you. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. We were we were lucky on our end that we'd actually had some one bulk stock up, so we're not in anything. But I mean, I was like, why are they? I couldn't understand. And then it just, I think it was like the only thing people could do. And so they were cleaning out and water. I'm thinking, well, water's not going to stop from the tap. Why is everybody <laughs> buying water? No, no. But let me do something real quick, and then we'll tell folks what we are uh, drinking before we get into the Cheaper by the Dram. I'm going to do a little roll call here, and then we'll talk about uh, we both poured our own separate dram before we get into the Cheaper by the Dram. 
Uh, we've got uh, Lochness in first. He was first on this Sunday afternoon. I'm going to even highlight you there because you were first. We got Roy Tarpey. Hey, dummies, or in this case, just dummy. Luis Sanchez is in. We had Luis with his opening good afternoon. We got, uh, let's see, David Parks. Go Habs is in. Oh, and I'm going to mess up. What is this? Uh, which, which master, I think? Let me just highlight because God knows I'll say that wrong, so we'll just highlight you up. Greg Lewis, Guns 816, uh, the Oak and Smoke Whiskey Reviews. Gosh, I love that title. That is just catchy. Uh, Malt Box, uh, Aaron Stack is in uh, the Malt Cask 50 pizzas, we're going to need that, or 500. Wow, I shorted you. It's 500 pizzas, not 50. What was I thinking? Let's see, Whiskey Dong's in from Denver. We'll have to see what it's like going on in Denver. I saw there's more cases in that general area. Big Dog's in, Florida fella. Jeff Iyer, uh, Trixmott, Donald Rant, Scott Slattery, Richie Z is in. Let me see. I'm starting to zoom through. Trey Koontz. Oh, now it's popping on me. We're getting comments flying in, and I can't keep up. Uh, <laughs> Donner Pass. All right. I know I missed Carl Van Willem, Wilhelm. Sorry, I always say your name wrong, Carl. I know it's my American, uh, the way I talk, and it's bad. Adam, Adam Whit, Tick, Luke P. And if I miss somebody, boom, we're good. Mark, so tell me what you have in your Glen Karen before we get to Cheaper by the Dram. Boom. It's, I mean, it makes me look really pretentious, but it's just a bottle that was on the shelf over there. So I like, so I'll sort of start prefixing tonight with sort of saying, I am not a sommelier and my palate is not incredibly adapted. I just like drinking whiskey and I like drinking old whiskey and things that I can't really get anymore. And this bottle I bought maybe 10, 12 years ago. So it's a bottle of Johnny Walker, black label, but it's from about the 1950s or early 1960s. So no ABV, uh, no sort of strength or capacity sort of stated in there. Uh, so it's the, yeah, Johnny Walker Black Label, but from the 50s or 60s, and it's absolutely stunning. <laughs> I'm a big fan of blends. Uh, what can I say? Some people don't like blends, but I think if you pick the right blend, it, they can be absolutely knockout. So. Oh, no, you're exactly right. I mean, Compass Box has taught us, you know, with what they do with blending. Yeah, yeah. blends can be fabulous. Completely. And Mark's telling the truth. We were starting off and I said, hey, I know we're going to be doing, you know, some cheaper by the dram, but I like to do a warm up and uh, go grab something. We literally had two minutes left. He was like, what? He ran off whoop, and he came back. So, yeah, there was no pre-plan on that. I am up. Let me get her on there. The Mirador, if I can turn it right. Now, this is the, uh, of course, Waco, Texas, Balcones. Their mirror door, they use a second fill, which is huge for them because you, it's so hot in Waco that when they put their whiskey down, and this is single malt, um, they literally can't keep it in the barrel for too long or it pretty much gets over oak. And uh, so they decided, I think this is their first uh, run where they used a, a second fill. And I don't know if it was in three years or not. I would have to look, and I think it was, and it is stunning. I mean, uh, Roy Aquavite was in town when we were down in Austin. He picked one up, and, I mean, he, he enjoyed it as well. It really – if when I taste it as a single malt, if you put this in a whole bunch of blind drams like we do it on our show and, and said, hey, they're all but one is scotch, I don't think I can pick this out. It is fabulous. Um, it doesn't have that uh, Texas – kind of spirit or that smoked hot spirit to it and it's just great so that's the balcones mirror door that i have what abv is that then it is oh and i got the lights down and they've got some black lettering on hold on i'm gonna do what i do because i am old it <laughs> is 50 i got my light on it it's 54. <laughs> 54.8. 54.8. Pretty soon I'm going to have to like do the, mic, the magnifying glass. <laughs> you know, like Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> oh, yeah. That'll be it. That'll be it. So that's what I've got going right now. And then I've got uh, I've got my uh, my little uh, glass here that uh, we'll be using for this nice dram we're going to have in a bit. Let me see. Let me see what other comments have rolled in. 
Let's see. I'll put something up. We've got Daniel is in. And uh, let's see. What's he got here? All fine here. So, you're Daniel, you're in Hungary. He's got a bit of a cold last week, but all fine now. I uh, hope you're all good. That may have just, uh, that might have got your system all fired up. So, now you're like bulletproof, Daniel. Bart at home. <laughs> there you go. Uh, sup, Bart AD here in Doncaster, UK. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got another one from Glasgow. We've got Alan. Hello from sunny Glasgow. All right. <laughs> hmm. We're down here today. Good, good, good weather today. So beautiful. We got 59 eyeballs. So, Mark, why don't you explain a little bit about Cheaper by the Dram? And then I'll show them uh, when you're ready. I'll show them what we're getting ready to, uh, to try and how you box it up. And I'm going to let them focus on you here go for it fab well hi everyone uh so so what is cheaper by the dram and how did i get into it then well basically my day job i'm a whiskey broker so my main website or my main line of work is marklittler.com and we i'm a broker i was an auctioneer for 10 years and then i broke a lot of sales of whiskey for buyers and sellers so we help people buy and sell bottles and we help people buy and sell casks as well but over the years people like me have arguably being part of the problem you know of, of, of pushing whiskey out of the hands of the drinker because i remember 10 years ago mccallan private eye was sort of less than two three hundred pounds and yet now it's what three three and a half thousand pounds so i wanted to do something that would bring whiskey back to the drinker like and not just sort of like normal whiskey but sort of like the old rare and the things that you would only expect to see the flippers getting their hands on so you know like mccallum private eye is one that i really want to do but we've done everything from sort of like optimal 1.1 we've got 1980s bottlings of brook Claddy. we've got 1970s glenn flagler the bottles that you only really find if you go get out get out your house and go to sort of like the old and rare show in london so we thought about or i thought about how do we set up the world's most amazing whiskey bar online and that's where we got going with cheaper by the dram so what we do we take single bottling so the one that we're doing tonight is this glengarry 21 1965 uh, an absolutely rare as rocking horse mm, muck bottle that's two two and a half thousand pounds in retail at the uk and i wanted a way to sort of it you know if you've got 30 pounds to spend 40 pounds to spend you can you can try a reasonably good whiskey but i would rather have 10 drams from 10 bottles than 10 drams from the same bottle so we, we uh, yeah just trying to help people get the rare rare and fine whiskeys back again to the drinkers and start selling them at auction you know it's for drinking <laughs> beautiful i love it so in, in presentation your presentation is real nice i like how when you open it up you got this card yeah, and really, as you then go in even deeper, this card doubles, and I'll pull it out here. It just kind of holds in as I uh, am. Yeah, my light's not going to get it. Yeah, I see it. Got yours. So, yeah, so you've got your fact card here. I don't know if that can, you can Perfect. see. Perfect. Yeah. So this is sort of like the – I want it to do like a top trump style card. Nice. Yes, exactly. I really like that touch because – You've got that nice look, and then there's your fact card, and then you've got your wee dram right there. Yeah, and you'll notice as well on the on the drams themselves, we don't label them with any details about the distillery, about the vintage, or anything like that. This is just a receptacle. So if you go back to that online bar, how do you set up an online bar? You can't pour whiskey into an envelope, so it has to go into a bottle. And to do that in the UK. It all has to be done. All the bottling has to be done up in Scotland by an extremely regulated warehouse and bottling facility. We then have to be very careful about trademark and copyright infringement. And that's why we've got this sort of like really sort of generic look really uh, to, the, to the drums, because to me, it's all about what's inside it. You know, we're not trying to make another product out of someone else's product. We're just about trying to get this to you. <laughs> and that's what it's like and we stick sample not for resale on there because there are other people you know we're not the first people doing this but we're the first ones that are really focusing on should we say the rare and older bottles 
But even then, you, you find people buying these, uh, you know, whiskey advent calendars and they're turning them up in auction. And it's like, come on, why are you selling samples at auction? It's to sample, you know? Yes. So, well, I know. I mean, there's folks, uh, we don't do it here, but I've heard there's folks with the little mini bottles, kind of like what you'll get on an airplane. Sometimes those as collectors even go for, for yeah. big money. And well, I, yeah. Go. Yeah. Private Eye, McCallum Private Eye, the, the the miniatures of that, I think I think they topped out at auction about 400, 440 pounds for a mini. Oh. So. Well, and now Scott's got a little bit more of the collector gene. Like he likes when we get compass box. Now they do such a good job with presentation and everything. He likes to get two of them and I get it. Um, I'm a big open it up and drink from it. Now I have yeah. extras, but those are usually ones that I like so much that I'm just trying to make sure I'll have them, you know, when I'm 55 and, you yeah. know, and then I'll, and so it's not that I'm holding on to it. I, I don't think I'd ever flip anything. Mine is all about, I want extras so that I'll have it, you know, when I'm, when I retire or whatever. And, and I think there's no problem with sort of like, so so I was like an accidental, so I came into this sort of by chance because I was collecting these whiskeys, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And then it's only as that market's changed that I got hold of like, whoa, <laughs> I can't afford to drink this anymore. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of people watching that have had that happen to them. You've got that one bottle that you're always saving, you're going to open. And now you've mm -hmm. got that bottle, it's like, can you afford to open it? And I get yeah. that, I get that you have to sell it at auction because you can't drink a two grand bottle. But I think that, the cynical side is sort of like those that are coming in and, you know, like McCallan Genesis and people like that and the Easter Elkies, just people that are buying solely with the intent to flip it because whiskey's for drinking. You know, we've got a, a hashtag at Chief Brother. It's like sip, don't flip. You know what I mean? Perfect. It, it's it's Perfect. what we do. So Yes. Yeah. And I mean, that's what we talk. And, you know, um, we talk with Roy, Roy Duff from Aqua Vita a lot about how whiskey's meant to be shared. And, Absolutely. you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're doing a virtual sharing here, but, you know, people come over and they'll look. And so non-collectors just see a bunch of liquor, but anybody that comes over that collects is like, well, almost all these are open. I'm like, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. There's no flipping going on here at all. Hold on. There's work, Colin. And that's what I did with the, so, so my background, so I, I was an auctioneer as well. So the whiskey is sort of like one side of what I do, but I also do a lot of, a lot of antiques, um, you know, silver, porcelain, whatever. And I get it, you know, people don't buy a dinky toy because of how well it brums. They buy it because of how rare it is and it goes into the collection. And that's what's transformed with whiskey now. It's not about how good McCallum 25 tastes. It's because of how scarce it is and how people put it into a collection now. And that's what's really changed in the in the industry. You know, it's gone from being a drink to a collector's item. And it's it's fascinating to watch. But I think for the people who are really into it, like the diehard people who, who enjoy drinking these, if you've got, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 pounds, you, you don't really get you, you can get a whiskey, but you, you can only go this far into the brand. Whereas mm -hmm. I like going like that far in you know what i mean it's like what what were they like in the 70s or the 60s and it's you know for instance two really so we release whiskies in pairs every month roughly speaking uh, and one of the pairings we did was a 1980s uh 15 year old lefroig versus a 1990s 15 year old lefroig nice so the 1980s one i think in the uk it's about 1500 pounds a bottle uh, retail and the 1990s is about three or four hundred pounds and we've released them for i think it's 35 pounds and 13 pounds so that you get a chance to see what changed and and, and this with it with with the with the lefroy it was really interesting because i've tasted them and the 1980s one is better but not not a thousand pounds better but it's yeah. it, it's it's that sort of thing that what what changes and that's what proves that whiskey is different to the wine market you know the wine market if robert park or the that you know the the wine advocate give a wine 100 points the price shoots up yet with whiskey it's not you know this glengarry it's quite well known with tasting notes but we've got mccallans and all sorts of cheaper by the drum which haven't got any tasting notes you know sergey at whiskey fun hasn't tasted you know there's no tasting notes on whiskey base these are undrank whiskies and that's a shame <laughs> yeah no, you're right on. Now let's pour this. Why don't you walk us through 
what we're pouring and what we're going to be sampling. Right. And I love that idea that with this, you're sampling the, I know not this, but although this is old too, but that idea of that old with the new of their comparisons that you're right, a lot of folks can't do when they're doing it. No, and that's it. And it's, and it's the way that we price these things. If you look, anyone who looks on on the shop, there's no, we don't stick a big margin on top of the bottles. Some of the bottles that we've released are cheaper it's cheaper by the dram than they are retail, the equivalent. So we just want to, it's like evangelical, you know, we want to get people drinking these old whiskeys. So tonight we've got a, a Glengarry 21 year old, 1965 vintage. There it is. Nice. 1965 vintage. So it's bottled in the mid 80s, 75 centiliters. It's only 43% ABV, uh, which is interesting, I think, as well when you taste it. But it's, you know, at retail now, this is sort of like a two and a half thousand pound bottle. Uh, and I'll just sort of say that there's, there's two of these Glengarry's. There's a light vatting and the dark vatting, and this one's the light vatting. And then we don't, we didn't put this one up for sale. So this one is sort of like a, should we say, a press special. Uh, it's for people like you and me to drink and enjoy together. And, you know, because I've done a few of these on a, a Vin OCD whiskey and Whiskey Wednesday and a few other people, and they've, they had comments sort of like, why can't we buy it? And it's like, you know, I would love to, and you can, but it'll cost, you know, our cost on this one was quite high. It'd be over a hundred pounds a dram on this one. And like, we've got up to more 1.1, that's only 45 pounds. So we try and keep the price down as much as we can, but let me go rinse my Glen Cairn. I'll be back in one sec. <laughs> rinse while I knows, but I'm going to see who else I can call out in the comments here. Let's see. Uh, everybody's talking about working from home. I can't do that in my job. <laughs> so let's see here. What else we got? I zipped up toward the top. Um, let's see. Day two. Whoops. See, I'm down at the bottom, and then the comments start popping. Uh, Cool. Got snow close four feet. All right. We'll just stay on here. And I should have poured this even a little bit earlier and let her open up, but I had. It's got a real nice, light, almost like a crisp sweetness. Hmm. Yeah, it's a really, really light nose, isn't it? It's yeah, I get a touch, just a touch of the malt. And I almost get like a little bit of that uh, tropical fruit note coming off of it as well. Hmm. Yeah, like uh, the sweets, what those tropical sweets called. Uh... We have a juicy fruit gum that it kind of has that sugary tropical. And it's very much like a like that tropical sugary sweetness, isn't it? It's not a, a bit of banana maybe. Yes. Yeah, I would agree with you there. I have saved some back for Scott, so I did not pour the entire because it is meant to be shared. So I'm going to share this with him as well. So when he gets back from uh, Texas in the uh, the failed attempt to cruise, he'll be able to try this as well. So I only poured half. And so, a tiny bit of smoke on the nose. Mm. I got to admit, I've almost ruined my ability to pick up subtle smoke. I'm so I'm a heavy peat head, and I like to get slapped around with it. And I, I literally can almost not pick up subtle peat anymore. Yeah. Huh. Huh. It's just so light, and it's got like this. Uh, it's, like, like I said, it's weird to describe it as clean and crisp, but it feels like that. Let me take a sip here. Mm. Mm. Envelops nicely. Oh, that's interesting. I almost got like pear, like a juicy pear note. Mm. Well, and then it, then it mid palate it kind of moves into that malty goodness. Hmm, and a nice vanilla finish. Mm. 
And I think the finish is for something that's 43% is pretty, pretty. It, the, I think the finish is almost the best part for me. It's like the, the nose is really light, but the finish just, it, it doesn't, the finish is way stronger than, than the nose would suggest really is. Mm -hmm. And it lingers. I think it ha had hung around for a good 15 or so seconds in the finish as well. And there's not that much peat in there. It's a really light sort of peat, isn't it? It's yeah, I've definitely destroyed my light peat palette. It's like a like a coal smoke sort of. You're right. You're right. Yeah, it's almost like uh, to me. It almost has hints of like the day after the bonfire. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a fair bit of tobacco as well. I would say in, on. Mm. Uh, let's see. Let me pop. I put it on the main screen. But uh, Dan Swank says, when did Bart lose the beard? Is this saying that uh, the Bart's not undercover anymore? Well, I was not undercover. Um, that was years and years ago where I did some undercover work. But um, what happened was a lot of our young officers were clamoring for the beards and the goatees. And luckily, we have a fairly young chief. Uh, I think he's in his early 40s. And he said, let's give it a shot. And uh, so we did a goatee thing around uh, No Shave November, and he extended that. And then in February, he said, let's, uh, let's do a beard for the month. Now, I love the beard. My wife loves the beard. And if they allow it, I will grow it back. Um, we all had to shave it um, come the new month. And that was a little sad. I actually liked the lines. Like, you've got your beard there, and I'm beard envious, Mark. Well, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a term for people without beards. <laughs> what is that, children? <laughs> <We're in>. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, there yeah. you go. Yeah, and I miss it. Man, do I miss it. It really just, I don't know. And Scott had his, too. So hopefully the uh, chief and his command staff are taking it under advisement. They did a cool thing, again, with a younger chief. Uh, he actually had guys and uh, guys put their photos out with both goatee and, and uh, beard, and they put them on Facebook, and people voted. Now, I didn't want to get in on that goodness. Um, the top five in each category got to keep theirs for one more month, which may mean the, the rules change and they don't have to shave at all. But I wasn't willing to do that. A little so side story, we've got a, a great guy. African American guy, and uh, his beard came in strong. He looked good, and he was kicking everybody's butt on the Facebook deal. And then, female posters started asking where he worked, so they knew where to speed. <laughs> <laughs> so that was hilarious, and I think his his post blew up into like. 15,000 posts with uh, all kinds of stuff that uh, I think the chief was probably getting ready to shut down even. So, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I did not put my mug on there. We had another guy that's a canine officer. So of course he had his dog over his shoulder guaranteed to win. So uh, you can't use props. I don't think. Yes, I know. I wanted to just go grab some lady's cat and try to get the cat people over. on that <laughs> <farm. laughs> So, I'm dog guy. I'm a dog guy all the way, though. So uh, just, let's see. Just Aaron. a comment fly in. Uh, DJ Cammy saying he's he. I think it looks like he's in Canada. And pff, yeah, sorry. There's just no way. You know, it's. I feel sorry for no. You know, you make some great whiskeys, but trying to get anything into you. I mean, we ship across the well we ship europe and us and uk but it, like as we found trying to get these drums over to you we can only ship to about 20 odd states because yep. the state rules are so incredible yep. uh, so it's but yeah i mean any canadians it's just game set and match isn't it you, you you've done what's in the in the liquor stores which is strange when you consider that that marijuana is legalized over there pretty much it's harder to get a glass of whiskey than it is a smoke but yeah, you think they would open it up? I mean, just open it up and tax it and get yeah. your money and go. 
And then you come to the UK and it's the complete opposite. You can pretty much buy any, you know, you, you're almost laughed at if you don't drink. If you go for a night out and you're not drinking, someone will laugh at you. They're like, come on, get a drink in you. And it's like, well, actually, when you think about it, it's still a drug, isn't it? You know, so, but no, nah, Canada and, you know, Hong Kong as well. We have, we ship to Hong Kong occasionally, 100% import duty there. So whatever the whiskey costs, 100% on top for that. So, wow. Yeah. Now here's been my hope, and I would I, I always like polling and getting the guests' opinion as well. So it's interesting as prices have really been going up, and of course demand's going up. You've also seen things from like you know American single malt or bourbon makers, or you know Taiwan's in, and you've got Tasmania coming out of Australia, and you've got all the Japanese whiskeys coming in, and we've got a lot of little startups around the states. Um, you know, you've got all the new distilleries coming in and in, uh, in Scotland and even UK in general. Um, it seems like, you know, I'm I'm hoping this worldwide demand stays. Yeah. But, you know, but at the same time, Scott and I have joked around the way it's going is at least we can we all see bourbon numbers. The amount of barrels laid down and the amount of barrels in warehouse. It's, it's unprecedented. It hasn't been at this level ever. And we keep thinking that maybe when we're both 65, 15 years from now, there'll be a glut. And you'll be able to go out and get great bottles of whiskey again for really affordable prices. But I don't know. Where are you at with, with world market and pricing and demand? And what are your thoughts? I think broadly speaking, the UK, like so, so the Scotch distilleries, broadly speaking, I think they release at a, at a fair price, in all honesty. I take, if you think if you, like, if you look at McAllen, for instance, they price their whiskies according to the their perceived quality so if you look at like the genesis you know it's really you know they know how hot their market is and they could release these at double treble quadruple the price but they don't they keep it level with the whiskey it's only on the secondary market that the prices really start exploding and that's when these sort of collectors and gannets start coming in and trying to get in on the market you see but I, the way that in the UK, you know, duty, it's £28.74 per litre of alcohol, and that's pure alcohol, so it's about £15 on a bottle of cast strength, some, you know, single malt. I think we are going to start seeing producers come down to sort of 50, you know, 50 mil, or, you know, 500 mil bottles rather than 700 mil bottles, because you're mm -hmm. at 750 in the US, aren't you? So again, I cut you off a little bit. No, 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 I'm I, I just saying that I think that, 50 CL bottles rather than 70 CL are going to be the way the industry moves to, because prices, even taxes and everything are going up. So I think that's just going to be a way to sort of keep it more accessible, really. It might. Um, we've got some weird laws on how we, you know, of course, ours are 750. Yeah. And then, and then we've got some rules on what they can do legal wise for smaller bottles. I my hope stateside, one, I'm dying, and there's a lot of our distilleries, American distilleries, working on creating a legal definition for an American single malt. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that'll be nice. And then there's this explosion, kind of like how the little micro breweries were blowing up. You've got distilleries coming around. Yeah, yeah. And so that's been nice, like, uh, you know, Iron Root. We found Iron Root Republic uh, in Texas, and they're, they're unbelievable. Baconis is doing well. Stranahan's, Westland. And so I'm hoping that that keeps pace, not, as well as what the Kentucky big boys are doing with putting out, you know, we, we did a blind 16-bottle uh, high-proof uh, bourbons, and we snuck in a Jack Daniels single barrel barrel proof, which we call the double barrel. <laughs> it's high proof. It technically follows all the rules of a bourbon with the extra Lincoln County method, but it was fabulous. And because they produce so much, it was like 54 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's great. So, you know, I'm hoping that even as demand has increased, um, supply will just continue to, grow it'll be interesting to see how those two things kind of war with each other yeah and i think as well i think that i don't think single malts are only ever going to get to this to the you know the, the the levels of demand like gin has i mean gin in the uk at the moment is just vast it's just everywhere mm. because single malt it's a connoisseur's drink you can't throw a mixer in it 
but with yeah. gin, it's like who drinks neat gin? It's always drunk with a mixer. So you can hide a whole host of sins with that. Whereas with single malts, it's so much harder to sort of get that sort of wide audience into it. So it's just about, you know, about educating people and, you know, coming back to this, for me, I mean, I'm, I I don't know how to score or rate whiskeys. You know, I'm just somebody who likes drinking whiskey. You know, this is sort of like a 92, 93 point whiskey in most places, but to me, it's a really nice whiskey. But is that is that worth two and a half grand to open? Right. Yeah. Not for you know. I mean, that's been my problem, and even Scott and I's problem, or the show's problem, is there's there's we definitely have a budget, and there are things we just cannot buy. Yeah. Scott, Scott does a really good job of having his fingers on the pulse, and he'll catch something off of the uh, interwebs or social media or whatever that hey, this is getting hot. And if we can find it, we'll get it before it's going crazy because we can't we we don't buy anything off for both for both cost and legal reasons with what we do for our day job. We don't buy anything off the secondary market. So we just yeah. buy uh, straight from the stores. But I couldn't afford the secondary market with the job I do at the at pricing company. I'd have to have some, you know, totally different job. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's like, it's funny enough some of the, the biggest repeat customers that we've had at Chief of the Drama have been people who have got their own YouTube channels or have got their own blogs because it's like, if you want to review an Optimal 1.1, 1 .1, you, you open a bottle, it's a grand, a thousand pounds in the UK. Can you afford to do that? No, but you know, for 40, 50 quid, it's something that's going to make a great video and makes a great content. So it's, in, in like you say, it does isolate, you know, you get limited don't you if, if price is your biggest thing you can either go for a full bottle 50 60 pounds ah, it's it's it, it's a crazy world you know it's a crazy world whoever thought it would get to this point where whiskey is now sort of like a status symbol and you know bottles are going for one one and a half million pounds and you know we're selling casks so we, we sell a lot of casks with my other job you know casks of mccallan one two three hundred thousand casks of Springbank. Mm -hmm thousand it's, it's insane numbers but who's right is the market undervalued and underappreciated at the minute or is it hot i mean i think the cask side of things interesting because the you know if you're the ultimate collector you can go and buy pretty much any bottle you want off the shelf you know and it'd be that at christie's for one and a half million pounds or something for one and a half million pounds but in terms of exclusivity anyone else can buy that bottle you know there might be a few the I'm trying to think of the name. Uh, who was the, the guy? That, the Michael Dillon. That's the only one that was one of one. And yet the 1926 Fine and Rare outperformed it at auction, even though it's the same whiskey, but in a wider series, it was rebottled. It's 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 bonkers. And But the casks are, are, are strange because that's like the ultimate status symbol. It's mm. like you can own a Lamborghini, but I can commission Lamborghini to make my own Mark Littler Lamborghini. You know, it, it's it's the ultimate status symbol really so right right yeah and you know that's been the cool part about um having the show is we've met just whiskey fans that definitely are opening bottles not saying they might not buy a second one or they've got one that they're holding back for when they yeah. retire or when their son gets married or whatever but I would say a majority of, of our watchers or fans are definitely folks that are opening the drams and enjoying them. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, we've had a few folks that, that are also huge collectors, but they were collecting when you could get unbelievable bottles for, you know, 35 bucks. Yes. Yeah. And it, it was a time when you could buy that sort of stuff. Like, I think this bottle cost me less than this, this JW. It probably cost me less than 40, 40 pounds or something like that. 30, 30 pounds or something. But it's the secondary market. And, you know, let's not forget that the rise of all of these online auctions as well as played a part, you know, without those platforms for people to sort of regularly trade in, there wouldn't necessarily be the market that we have today, you know, the secondary market. So it is, you know, there was always McTears and Bonhams and people like that auctioneering whiskey. But I think it was when the when the online platforms like in the UK, Scotch Whiskey Auctions, Whiskey Auctioneer, Whiskey Dot Auction, they really blew the place open and make it it's it's almost, you know, I bid there, I try and find a rare bottle there, but it's it's addictive. You know, it's like 
when, when you're bidding and you're in the lead and someone else takes it off you, it's like, that's my box, I'll stop bidding on it. And it's well, here's a question. Yeah. You would be, if I had to guess your age, I would guess you at 34 years old. 35. Okay. See, I'm pretty close. Now, yeah. now you bought that that Johnny Walker, you said what, 12, 15 years ago? Yeah, yeah. So you were you're literally one of these guys I'm talking about where you were collecting before it was a thing. You were into it at a very young age. Yes, yeah. So I was a whiskey auctioneer at the very so it's a, I ran a wine auction. And then at the end of the wine auction, we'd always have 10, 20 bottles of whiskey. And, you know, whiskey, I got into whiskey drinking it with my dad, uh, you know, Glen, Glen Fiddick Special Reserve. And it's, it's funny, you know, that dram, even now, because of the memories it brings back, yes. drinking that with my dad at the time, I, you can't beat it. You know what I mean? It's, it just right. triggers all these things off in your head. But it's, it, yeah, it was sort of like you were buying these bottles. And I think there's so many people out there that were buying these bottles and building up these collections. And it's, oh, so accidentally their, their whiskey collections were worth more than their house. It's like, what? Yeah. And it's, yeah. And yeah, let's see. We got what Joey Shortpants says I should work at a carnival for guessing ages. Well, that comes with the police job as well. <laughs> so, but thanks, Joey. I'm good on that. Well, I kept thinking you're exactly. You're even a fairly young auctioneer. How did you get into the auctioneer business at such a young age? So I was a, I, I did a degree in fine arts and realized that I had a few exhibitions when I was at university and then realized that the galleries would take 50 to 60 percent of what they you know what you sell. So I thought, hang on a minute. So I went to university to do a master's uh, and to sort of work in museums and galleries. And then I learned about the technical way is a sociological construct of valuing cultural goods. So why is one chair worth more than another? So why is a chair made by Thomas Chippendale worth two or three hundred thousand and one made by Ikea worth 20, 30 pounds? So like the reasons and the social structures about why why objects are worth what they are. And then I just took a sidestep into working at an auction house and I've got one of those brains that is always sort of asking questions and always wanting more information. And it just just grew from there so I, i'm quite a well, I, I, an expert is a terrible term and an x is a has been and a spurt is a different <laughs> pressure but i'd say that i'm quite a, a specialist in antique silver as well so we sell a huge amount of silver for people it, it, it's yeah I, I, I absolutely love silver too but again it's like when you, if, if you turn that into to the whiskey world why is mccallan worth more than let's say uh aaron for instance sure. but it, again it's like it's the social structures and it's and it's what the mccallan brand says about you that the aaron doesn't and it's the same with watches you know rolexes patex they tell the time in a fairly clumsy manner compared to your apple watch you know they're expensive to service but it's the status that these give you and it's you know if, if all whiskey came like this generically bottles there the probably wouldn't be the the rush that we have today you, you know that that sort of s demand for bottles like easter elkies who on earth opens easter elkies black you know who on earth opens private eye people don't they collect it so it's it's a bizarre bizarre industry isn't it now so looking at something like let's say what compass box is doing where they're they're not only making great whiskey that tastes good you can tell the amount of work that's gone into the presentation, the artwork, even the bottle, the glass work. Yeah. The, I had a compass box. I absolutely love them. I've got one of their, the last vatted malts. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the last ever bottling that they could call vatting rather than it being a blend. And it came in this uh, Perspex presentation case. And compass box are one of those companies as well that, their labels just look so fresh and yeah. i mean oh man I, I love graphic design and you look at the majority of labels that go out in the whiskey market and it's just like it's so cliched and old it's like ah just get working with some young designers that are going to pump some life into it and oh yeah oh, I, yeah his no name you know i mean i was like what i had to know more just calling it no name i was like what are you talking about you can't do that yeah, and it's, you know, some of the people that are doing things with whiskey, I mean, Ardbeg, you, you can say what you want about their sort of like annual releases, you know, like the grooves and, and, and whatnot. But what I think they do, 
and, and if you forget about people flipping them, is that they're working with sort of no age statements, but right. it's all about the taste, it's not about the age. And it's like, what, what frustrates me the most at the minute in the market is when you can basically have a whiskey in a bottle, and it'll be black as treacle and be like, whoa, this is gonna be the best whiskey yet. Well, if you want a sherry, drink sherry <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean it's i don't know it's it, it's so much people drink so much with the eyes now don't they it's it, it, well it's like this if, if if you didn't know that this was two and a half grand would you say it was two and a half grand i would not no right no yeah i don't think you can you yeah i'm with you and and ben's got a he called out stranger and stranger is the compass box design art guys that are just yeah. just fabulous so and that's that's exactly what Compass Box does. They definitely create a deal where sometimes, um, like Scott, and I totally get it, if he doesn't have a backup, he hates to open it up because it's kind of a work of art in and of itself. Yeah, and they do UV labels and everything, don't they? And But again, like Brooklady, Brooklady, again, if you think what the arc of Brooklady has been, you know, they're sort of like a failed distillery in the early 90s. They get taken over by a, a group of entrepreneurs so to speak with a with a fresh vision and fresh drive yeah. they get bought out again and so they're sort of in that big monopoly again you know of companies but how have they branded and repositioned that brand over the years has been incredible and you know just the focus you know optimal can you pete monster can you imagine a world without optimal like exactly this, this exactly. We think it's a quite a revolutionary industry, but at the end of the day, they're just lots of different labels and lots of different bottles. And what I like about Optimore is, is the, you know, the black bottles, you know, <laughs> where's the last dram? No, yeah. it's gone. You yeah. know. Or even what they do with black arts. You know, yeah. they come out and tell you, we're not going to tell you what's in there. And they create this whole mystique around it. And that's good. I mean, it's marketing, but they, but then I don't like the newer ones as much, but like the 3.1 and the 4.12, I love those two bottles. They were great. And it's yeah. it, it, oh. it, bringing it back to the palette, isn't it, rather than sort of like the, you know, the presentation's a big thing about it. But again, it's like, ooh, which distilleries out there now are really producing something that is different and, and, and is challenging in a way, you know, everyone's, finishing in this side and the other to sort of try and stand out and it, it, is that just as, as a way to sort of mask sort of cheap young spirit you know it's put anything in an octave and it'll finish in a few months and be the most sherry beautiful whiskey you can have but it's i don't know the distillers I, you know the companies can't afford to lay down these reserves for as long as they used to you know right. older age statements are going incredibly incredibly expensive and you know what are age statements? You look at grain whiskey. Man, there's some cheap, good grain, you know, in the yeah. Stunning whiskey when you get it right, but it's yeah. it's grain. It's not sexy, is it? So, Yeah, yeah, I know I got it. And um, let's see some comments here. You know, matter of fact, the Black Arts where I had the 3.1, it was funny. So I'll give you, someone called out my nerddom earlier. I was at a board game convention. I love board games just like I love whiskey. And I was talking to one of the booths, one of the distributors that actually made these very expensive um, board gaming tables. And, and he kind of leans over and says, I heard you like whiskey. And I said, oh, yeah, I love whiskey. <laughs> and he literally says he was from San Francisco. I think he says, come behind the booth real quick. And he hands me like a Dixie cup which is not the preferred way to try your whiskey. And then he pours some Black Arts 3.1 into the Dixie cup. <laughs> and then he, his eyes, and he gets excited because what he sees me do right away is cover the Dixie cup and lean in and just try to get a good nose off of it. And he goes, oh, you're going to like this one. <laughs> and I knew it was a dram that Scott would love. And I was like, wow, I'm going to be finding this. And that's why I had to get the 4.1. But uh, yeah, what they were doing um, was simply, was simply great. Let's see. Uh, this is a good comment from Brian here on the uh, Joseph Magnus cigar blend. Uh, Nancy Fraley, uh, we call her Nancy the Nose. She's working with uh, Joss Magnus and they're putting out some beautiful uh, bourbons and, and American whiskeys, just beautiful stuff they're working on. And there, there's an interesting comment there from Scrinoogee, 
Squinoogee. He's saying, uh, I love drinking whiskey from the 60s and I can only drink them because people collected them. And I guess that's a good way to look at it, really. You know, without people collecting these bottles, would we be able to sit here today and talk about them? It's, you know, it's, it's a good sort of way to flip the conversation on its head, isn't it? You know, the, the role that collectors have, you know. That's, that's, a, good point. that's a very good point. I mean, um, we have a friend who... Uh, um, we know very casually, but uh, fairly, fairly wealthy and invited us over and said, hey, come over here. And then we were like, oh, my God. I mean, he was collecting for years and years. And he said, try, you know, try this and try this Port Ellen. And we were like, what? You know, I mean, so, yeah. And and it was delicious. And I, I was like, uh, first of all, it's not going to be that good, probably. And it was. And. And I was like, wow. And it was so nice that here he was, not only he had he'd been a collector probably for 20 years, um, but he was so willing to share. And that's that whiskey enthusiasm. So I yeah. try not to snobbery from the down up either. I mean, you know, he he he's made a lot of money, but he loves he loves whiskey and he yeah. loves sharing whiskey as well. And, and, and like one of the things, one of the lessons that I've learned, so from being an auctioneer and sort of selling people's collections and selling people's bottles for probably the best part of 15 years now, the amount of widows that I've dealt with oh. that come to me with a special bottle that the husband was saving for a special day. And you know what? It would be their wedding anniversary. It wasn't special enough. The grandchildren would get born. It wasn't special enough. They would pass university, you know, grandchild would get through university, not special enough. So... You know what, with, with what's happening in the world today, if you've got a special bottle there and you, you know, and it's got a sentiment and it's not just expensive for the sake of being expensive, but it, it, if it does have sentiment, open it and share it with your friends because, you know, look what's happening out there. It's not, not business as normal in a way. You know, we are mortal, and, you know, whiskey's for drinking and the amount of people that have died with that special bottle never drank it. Honestly, it must be, I must be over 50, over 50 widows that I've met and done bottles for like that. So now that is a very good point. That brings us back full circle. And it's a good thing to know. Everybody knows the odds are women are going to outlive us and not saying that we don't have female viewers as well. But for those guys holding that bottle back, make sure you're opening that up and sharing it. That is perfect. I'm going to open some more mirror door here. That is, you you bring a great perspective there. That is a very, very nice perspective. I've never even thought of that. That you're basically dealing with widows. They're not into whiskey, and they know it's a precious bottle. It never got opened, and so they reach out and say, hey, you know, let's pass it on to someone else. Yeah, and, and you wouldn't believe the amount of widows and sort of older, you know, like, for people, so broadly speaking in the UK, doctors, people in engineering and accountants, a bottle of whiskey was always a thing that you'd be given at Christmas. So we've, you know, when we sort of, should we say these accidental collectors, they're like a GP or like a doctor in the UK. And then they've been, you know, every Christmas they'll get given a bottle. And, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, these weren't expensive bottles, you know. Sure. What, what to more 1.1 when it came out? Was 75, 78 pounds, something like that. And then as the, the, the sort of time's gone on, they've got no idea that these they're sat on sort of two or three thousand more, ten thousand pounds worth of whiskey just in the cupboard. You know, one of the, the the great ones is Chartreuse, sort of like the the French, oh, which how do you describe Chartreuse? It's like a liqueur, sort of like a herb. Wow, what's Chartreuse? What how do you define that? Because uh you get a we've sold that for you know thousands, you know, the early turn of the century ones. Yeah, if, if, yeah, a liqueur is, is what it's technically termed. Mm. But yeah, mm. Chartreuse is incredibly, incredibly valuable. And the amount of people that I've met that have poured it away because it looks like it's absolutely nothing. So, mm. Yeah. Well, we're closing in. We're at 54 minutes. We are going to end at one. I know Roy's got a show a little bit later. So guys, go over and check out Aqua Vitae. But um, great discussion. And uh, uh, Mark, I could definitely, someone even threw in the comments that every year in July, I'm not, I have to get with Scott. He's got schedules that he works out, but we, we do a 12 hour 
12 hours of boom where we have guests on 10 yep. different guests and we we rotate them in and it's a it's a marathon episode um <laughs> we'll, we'll reach out to you i'd love i don't know if it'd be this year but i would love to have you on at some point in time i gotta get with scott he's the one that kind of tracks all that um yeah yeah scott is very good on spreadsheets i am not i'm very ad hoc but Let's circle back because we are down to about our last six minutes or five minutes. Talk about cheaper by the dram again, and just kind of let everybody know where they can find you, where they can find cheaper by the dram. So it's cheaper by the dram.co.uk. And I think, you know, if I, I'll read off sort of some of the ones that we've got available at the minute and the prices in the UK. So let me just tell you that. So we've got Optimal 1.1 1 .1, uh, at £45 a dram. We've got a 1980s bottling of uh, Brucladi. Uh, let me just get this up. Hey, I'm going to get it right. It's a, a 10 year old from the 1980s. That's 18. We've got a, a, now. This is a stunning one. It's Macallan. It's from the As We Get It series by J and G Thompson. So it's a cask strength Macallan. It's not on whiskey front. It's not on whiskey base. No one's reviewed it yet. Basically, a cask strength 1980s bottled Macallan, 30 pounds. We've got Lafroig 15 year olds. Uh, We've got a stunning White Horse 1958 blend uh, from what from 1958. It's absolutely amazing. There's loads of black of in there, and there's a bit of malt mill. And we just do, you know, that's the sort of whiskies that we, you know, it's not the average whiskey that you'll find on your shelf for a bar. It's the sort of ones you'd have to go to the old and rare, you know, show to find out. I think you've got some uh, good drams coming up. I think you might be doing a separate review on. I think you've got a Kalila 1969 Connoisseur's Choice and a Dalwini uh, 1962. And I think you're going to be reviewing those together, aren't you? So you betcha. You bet. Thank you. But it's, yeah. you know, cheaper by the drama as a nutshell is opening the bottles that no one else dares to open and making them available. So that, that's, that's it. If you like drinking rare and old and unusual things, you can find it and it's not expensive you know we've got drams from 10 pounds you know they're averaging at 10 or 20 pounds each now you us shipping is a bit of a pain i must admit because this is a tiny box yes and it costs 33 pounds to ship to the us but it costs roughly the same to ship one or ten because yeah. there's no weight in it it's just the volume of it so but we can group orders together and you know same with europe as well so yeah, and we've got a lot of whiskey clubs that watch our show, so that's a perfect way for them to get in. Obviously, if they've got bigger groups, they're going to have to figure out how they're going to work those drams around, but they could definitely do that. And you know what I think might happen? I think I could see with Brexit, and I know what's going on, I could see UK, Canada, and US becoming major trade partners. And I would love to see some of you know, as that circle of trade kind of comes around, man, I could see it. Boy, would I love the whiskey element of that if we became like massive traders just between the three of us even. Yes, and imagine Canada opening up its borders with whiskey a bit more. And, you know, yeah. what they're producing some sensational whiskeys. And, again, uh, it's – but at the minute, it's 25% import duty going into the yeah. U.S., isn't it? It's, yeah. um, I know. I'm going to reach out to the people I do not know. <laughs> and I'm going to say Trump or whoever, we need what's called the whiskey trade triangle is what we need. <laughs> and it needs to be no import tax. We just flow that, that whiskey just flows freely around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. My dream. That would be my dream there. And we <laughs> can, because man, Canada's got some unbelievable stuff going. Um, but Someone's uh, that if we ship to Europe. Yes, we ship all over Europe. Uh, again, it's cheaper, you know, it costs pretty much the same to ship one dram or 15 drams. Uh, so, yes, we can. And to be honest with you, what we found as well, speaking about whiskey clubs, is that when people in Europe have been making an order, they'll club together with a few of the friends. And, you know, I want to make it as cheap as possible. I can keep the drams as cheap as possible, but I've got no control on the postage. So, yep. I understand. <laughs> We got Daniel here. I have a Bermuda Triangle in my wallet if it comes to whiskey. Yeah, me too, Daniel. Me too. All right, beautiful. We're at fifty nine seventeen. Um, so a uh, great show, Mark. Thanks uh, so much for coming on. Great. Thank you for that. Cheers.
You bet. We'll have you on again when my co-host is here. He's definitely, I always say he's, he's got his finger on the pulse. Uh, I'm the Pete head. He's the Sherry head. We love whiskey in general. So again, thank you. Uh, everybody check out Cheaper by the Dram. Um, it was a pleasure. And again, just to show you some proof, I don't know if you can see it, but there is liquor, liquid in there. I'm saving it for Scott. He'll be able to check it out as well. So I didn't do him dirty. Everybody stay safe out there and uh, keep your head. And there's nothing wrong with bunkering down with some buddies and enjoying whiskey. Not at all. <laughs> Mark, hang on a second, Mark. I'm going to end the broadcast. It'll take a few seconds. Thank you all for tuning in. Scotch it, you Scotch gods. Go on, you dummies.